It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 170, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Rebecca Graff and Tom Ruggieri raise vegetables for a 100-member CSA, manage a small laying flock, and operate a cottage-scale fermented food business at Fair Share Farm, 45 minutes north of Kansas City, Missouri. They've been farming together on family land since 2004 after meeting in the fields at Peacework Organic Farm in upstate New York. We dig into the nitty-gritty of their member-oriented CSA and the changes it has undergone in the last couple of years as Rebecca and Tom have looked to change the farm's economic basis and their quality of life. Tom and Rebecca share how they've changed their sign-up process and their work requirement as their CSA has gone through these transitions. We also take a hard look at their fermented foods production and how that fits in with their vision for the farm and the CSA model, as well as the efforts they've made to reduce the overall ecological footprint of the farm with a solar greenhouse, an electric tractor, and a vigorous cover crop and soil building effort. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. Vermont Compost. Com. And by Local Food Marketplace, helping farms and food hubs around North America implement easy-to-use online ordering systems that integrate with a full management system for order packing, invoicing, and payment processing. Contact localfoodmarketplace.com to learn more. And by Haas Tools. Haas Tools is the complete solution for all your farm market farming tools and supplies. From wheel hose, precision seeders, heavy-duty seed trays, drip irrigation, and organic pest control, they've got you covered. Get free shipping and outstanding customer service at HaasTools.com. Rebecca Graff and Tom Ruggieri, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having us, Chris. We're excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'd like to start off today by having you guys tell us about Fair Share Farm. How much are you guys growing? Where are you doing that? And how are you getting that product to market? Sure. Yeah, we started our farm, Fair Share Farm, in 2004, and uh, we're on my family's land, so um, we're outside of Kansas City, Missouri. It's about uh, 45 minutes from downtown Kansas City. We are north of the city. For those who may be more familiar with Iowa, it's kind of like Iowa, but we're farther south, so the soils aren't as deep. But we have a little bit of that lush, windblown soil here. Um, We're farming ridgelands. We do not have creek bottoms. And since it's my family farm, we're farming the land we have. We grow a wide variety of vegetables for a CSA. And we've done that since the beginning. We focused on growing for a CSA exclusively for the most part. And um, at our highest membership, we had... 150 members. We're now sticking with 100 members going forward and uh, started a commercial kitchen uh, in 2016. And we are making uh, live culture fermented food from our vegetables, primarily sauerkraut and kimchi and cucumber pickles. Our area that we farm is, at the most, we're probably doing five or six acres. Last year, we did an acre and a half um, of actual crops. The way that our ridgeland is, we try and just stick to the the flattest ground and uh, um, have a lot of cover cropping intermixed with that. You could look at our farm and say it's maybe a 20-acre farm. That includes our irrigation pond that we use. It's just, you know, on the family farm, plus our outbuildings and our home. It's probably a total of 20 acres. Uh, We are on a family land that's 280 acres, so we have a little bit of a buffer in that sense between us and our neighboring corn soybean farmers, which is the primary farming activity out here. Corn, soybeans, beef, cattle, pasture for the most part. So the remainder of the family farm was in row crops, but back in 2012, my father sowed it into a native grass perennial system. And this past year was the first year that we were able to have that combine and we're actually selling native grass seed off of that land. It's been a great transition for the family farm to have that shifted to something more sustainable for the long haul. And then, you know, our organic ground is a little bit more protected from drift, et cetera. 
when we started, we were uh, pretty green. Uh, we met on a CFA farm outside of Rochester, New York, called Peace Work Organic Farm, where Elizabeth Henderson was farming. So how did you guys get started? I mean, you're talking about starting in 2004. What came before that for you? I first heard of CSA and got hooked on the idea of coming back to the family farm when I was living in San Francisco, California. I moved into a household that was a drop-off site for Terra Firma CSA and started reading their newsletter. This was like 2000 and just had the idea. At the time, I was working for a nonprofit, doing community organizing and kind of social service work and I loved the work, but I didn't love living in the city. I thought I was going to become, you know, a a city person, but I grew up out in the middle of nowhere out here on the farm, uh, and I don't think I quite realized how much that still held a place in my heart. So I hadn't really grown up growing vegetables of any kind, so I uh, realized I needed to start apprenticing on farms, and I applied at just out of some strange luck, like I didn't even realize where I was landing, but I ended up at Peacework Organic Farm, which is the farm that Elizabeth Henderson ran for many years outside of Rochester, New York. And the farmers there are just excellent vegetable growers. Plus they had an amazing CSA model, a participatory model with people coming and helping with the harvest. Um, They had a work requirement for all of their membership And it was that model that really got me excited about coming back to the family farm and bringing people to the farm and giving them that experience that I had had as a kid growing up out here. I guess Tom can talk about how he came to it, but that was my inclination. So I I moved, you know, to peace work and apprenticed there and uh, yeah, got the bug. And then uh, the members started coming out for their work days. And lo and behold, Tom Rogeri came out for his work shift. So yeah, Chris, I was um, lived in Rochester. I was there for about um, 20 years. I was an environmental engineer, health and safety professional. And I kind of tried to drop out a couple times. I used to say I was an environmental engineer, but nobody ever talked about the environment. So it was my training and my profession, but it, uh, it was really just about liability, kind of protecting corporations and businesses from their environmental needs. And uh, at one point, I, I had a house and I sold it, and a friend of mine told me about the CSA, and it's kind of what I wanted to do. I figured I really wanted to get out and, you know, get my hands in the dirt, but I didn't necessarily need to own my own home to do that, and the CSA was a perfect opportunity for that. So, uh, yeah, I came out for my work day. I mean, I'm kind of the same as Rebecca. I I was part of, the C, of Liz's CSA, and I'd come out, and I'd work with my fellow members and Really, that conversation was what got me a lot more aware of the politics of food and really more of the environmental issues surrounding food. And in 2001, Rebecca came out and she was apprenticing and we met and I had quit my job at that point. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. You know, I wanted to find a job working with my hands. I was trying to be a, a photographer. I did a lot of darkroom work hand-colored photos and I was selling those and that Rebecca and I could I could see that you know she did the same thing she quit her job and she was pursuing something and I could see that she was somebody that really and truly had vision you know this wasn't some just type dream she was talking about here she not everybody has a vision and I think that's kind of what I recognized so we decided as we say to uh to start wagon and then we went and apprenticed at um, Michaela farm in Indiana which is close to my home in Cincinnati. We did that for a year, and then we came out here and started the farm. And when you came back to the family farm, Rebecca, was did your family have an organic bent, or were you carving Fair Share Farm out of conventional corn and soybean ground? So, yeah, the whole farm was rented out to you know neighboring farmers that were raising corn and soybeans and then there was some pasture that was rented out to some people that had beef cattle the farm itself you know when I was growing up out here it was the 80s and the farm crisis and all that and the only reason why 
we still had the farm was because my dad had a computer science degree and drove into the city an hour and a half every day and had a, you know, a day job. And luckily that meant that the farm didn't need to be sold or, you know, we didn't have a huge financial crisis during that time period and had to, you know, sell it. But the reality was when we came back, no one had been living on the farm or really putting much attention on the farm for a good 20 plus years. So there were outbuildings, but they were half fallen down or there was a really big equipment barn that had fallen down. The house hadn't been lived in for many, many years and needed a lot of work. And we had an old, uh, my grandpa's tractor that my dad had also used from the 60s um, that we're still using today. So we had some, you know, infrastructure that was really had a lot of potential, but you know, the farm itself was needing a lot of attention. Um, my dad is very kind of ecologically minded. So that was a huge help that he not only had farmed this land and, you know, cultivated corn and soybeans, which nobody does anymore, but, you know, knew something about equipment and, oh, a little bit about everything, you know, electrical work, plumbing, fit repairing things, you know, a typical farm hats that every farmer wears. So he was a huge partner in us getting the farm back together and getting it producing again. And it took us a while. Tom maybe can talk about soils more, but, you know, the ground was eh, not in the best shape. You know, I mean, a conventional system, you just kind of kill off the soil life. And there just wasn't a lot of life in the ground. And we were growing cover crops and they wouldn't even germinate. You know, I mean, it was just uh, really the first few years, pretty tough going just to transition from conventional row crops to an organic vegetable, you know, system. So how did you guys go about doing that? Because, I mean, you're talking about, well, kind of two things all at once, which is making that transition from a conventional farming soil, but also working on land that, clay soils, right? This is not exactly vegetable ground. Right. Now, I would say, you know, they're, the barn that we are still using today is an old tobacco drying barn. So, you know, our soil, yes, it's definitely ridgeland. And, uh, you know, we don't have these nice sandy creek bottom, you know, well-drained soils for sure. But we do have fairly rich soils and we've been able to make them work. And, it's not like uh, we wouldn't love to have a bunch of sand underneath our soil instead of clay, but, you know, we've been able to manage it. And it's kind of over the years, we figured out how to do that. You know, we came from our apprenticeships on beautiful creek bottom, sandy soil types. So we didn't really know how to manage our soils until we got here and just started trying. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we talked about, just the whole idea of like a cottage industry for the farm kind of comes out of that. Our soils are very workable, but it's nice to have a little bit of cushion on the farm finances to also have some value added products coming out of our farm as well. So that we're not just relying on one revenue stream to provide for us going into the future. I mean, I think that when we started, we thought we were going to be at a much bigger scale than we are now. We thought we'd just kind of keep increasing. I think PeaceWork had like 300 members when I was there. So that was kind of our model. But then when we started actually looking at the ground and farming the ground, we realized really, you know, 100 members and um, a little bit more diversified income was going to make more sense for our rich land that we were farming. Did you start off with the additional cottage industry or is that something that you added in later? Um, well, it's, it's always kind of part of our vision statement or whatever we call it when we started that Tom, he doesn't come from a farming background. He does come very much from a food background, I guess I would say, His, you know, and you can talk more about that. But he always uh, had a lot of talents around value adding, uh, making tomato sauce and wine and cheese and cooking. So we always wanted to somehow include that in our farm business. And it just took us a while before we felt like we were ready to make that jump. Yeah, kind of going back to the start, you know, we've focused on the soil pretty much 
since the beginning. When we were in the Northeast, we'd go to NOFA conferences and you go to those workshops and, you know, this was 15 years ago and there'd be people talking about the, you know, virtues of one cover crop versus another and they'd been doing it for 30 years. So we could see the value of it. And as an environmental engineer, I understood the power of microorganisms. I got my training to start with in biological wastewater treatment, which is just, you know, to take sewage and add bacteria to it and aerate it and you um, degrade the pollutants. So all those things were kind of inherent in my technical knowledge. And when we started here, like Rebecca said, the soil was quite dead to the point where we were having trouble even getting the cover crops to really grow at first. So we had to do a lot of mineral additions and liming and cover cropping. And you can uh, look on our uh, website, fairsharefarm.com, and we have a, a page on uh, carbon sequestering. And, and we show our soil organic matter over the years. And for the first five years or so, it was between uh, two and a half and three. And it actually started kind of going down even for a while. Because it took us a while to reestablish the infrastructure for the microorganisms in the soil and then actually build up the population to boot. So it was only after about five or six years that our organic matter really began to go up to the point now where our average uh, organic matter is more between four and five percent. So we've gone up almost one and a half percent in uh, organic matter over the years. And it's nice to be where we are now versus then. I mean, that's a very big difference to have a soil that that's, is that alive um, that you're growing in and we can grow more in the same area. So kind of what Rebecca was saying, we were thinking we're just going to keep expanding, but we've actually been contracting a little bit more to take advantage of our improvements in the soil quality. And so with the hundred family CSA, is that the only market that you guys have? Yeah, the kind of cottage industry Rebecca's talking about. So a couple of years ago, we had 150 member CSA and it was every week we had extended season two. So we had 31 weeks where every week we had shares. And after what amounted to 13, 14 years of that, we felt that we really needed to take a break. So last year we went to 100 shares every other week. So it's more of a 16 week season. And then we started focusing on our ferment business in 2016, uh, we finished construction of a certified kitchen and we prepared a HACCP plan, hazard assessment, critical control point plan that allows us to do fermenting. And then uh, last year was our first real year of production. And so the idea is that we've, we're shooting for the same kind of income that we had with the 150 member CSA, but now we have a more diversified product, the CSA and then the ferments. So you guys geared down last year and did the every other week CSA. Is that how you're going to continue into the future? Or was that just to take some time and get the fermentation business up and running and do some evaluation of where you were at and where you wanted to be in the future? We were really happy with the every other week CSA. And we surveyed the membership and 98% of the respondents were happy too. It was kind of shocking how many people were enjoying it. You know, we were doing two share sizes and then every week, you know, we were doing a buffet style distribution model where, you know, we're packing 50 bunches of carrots in crates and then saying, you know, carrots take one bunch down the line, you know, our numbers pick up out of the crates. So two share sizes every week for 150 numbers. So anyway, we, it was a lot and we just felt like we needed a break and we also needed some time to just kind of rethink everything. Like we felt like we were like going on repeat of what we had done the year before and we really felt like we needed some space to try some new ideas and not take, you know, such a large amount of money from people that we felt like we didn't have time for anything else. We just needed to focus on, you know, making sure we had, you know, shares every week. So Anyway, it worked out great. You know, we called it a sabbatical. I think we put a blog post up in September of that year uh, where we were starting to think about it. The the term sabbatical isn't quite what ended up happening, uh, but just the the space of having a week off was just really dramatic for us. And, um, you know, we were able to travel a little bit in the summer leave the farm, we were able to have some time for the ferment business to get that up and running for sure. We have a flock of, oh, 70 
chickens. So just doing some of the work associated with the chickens, that was really helpful to have a week off so that we're not trying to figure out what day of the week we can move the chickens that we're not going to be like harvesting right after that. You know, from a food safety perspective, it's really nice to have, you know, get that stuff done and then, you know, don't go harvest spinach, you know. So it really seemed to work better for our model that we were developing with more diversity of products. And um, and the membership has really been supportive. We didn't advertise during that year for any new members coming in. So they were pretty much all um, our existing membership is who signed up. And we told them up front, you know, we weren't sure how it was going to go. It was a little bit of an experiment. We were reducing the amount of crops we were growing as well. So trying to focus on the favorite crops a little bit more and get rid of some of the uh, less liked crops, but also crops that didn't grow as well for us. So, you know, we're not growing melons and winter squash, which in our climate is a real battle. Uh, We have so many generations of squash bugs and cucumber beetles in our climate that they really have to struggle to get melons and winter squash. So we took those crops out. I know your your favorite kohlrabi was not planted. <laughs> yes. So we just tried to, you know, simplify things and streamline things. So we did one share size. People had two weeks to get through it all. So that seemed to work for everybody. So it made our lives easier. I think we made our members' lives easier. We scaled back on the work requirement. So we haven't talked a lot about that yet. But, you know, when we started farming here, we pretty much took Piecework Organic Farms CSA model and tried to import it to our location. And for the most part, it's been great. And our members have loved it. It's one of their favorite things about our CSA. We love it. We love having everybody come out. But we had a pretty hefty work requirement. So for a full share, you had to do three farm shifts from 8 to noon on a Saturday or a Wednesday morning. So for some families, that wasn't a big deal because they had three plus people in the family and they just brought everybody. But if you were a single person or a couple, that meant you had to come out more than once. So we scaled back on that. We just said, everybody needs to come out once, bring as many people as you want, and just felt like we were just trying to allow for flexibility with people's schedules, people's family sizes. I think people appreciate that. And yeah, so so here in 2018, we're planning on, or we are pretty much using the same system that we used last year. We realized we could grow a little bit more than we thought, and the shares are going to be a little bit bigger than they were last year. But otherwise, we're sticking with it. So that work requirement to me is a really interesting part of your CSA because I've reflected before on this show on the difference between what I think of as the two different models of CSA. You know, there's kind of the customer subscription agriculture model, and then there's the really the community supported agriculture model. And it really feels to me like you guys have focused on building that community that supports your farm. And part of that is getting people out consistently throughout the season to the farm to engage in real work on the farm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it helps us. We get each family coming out to help with the harvest. So that means our labor costs are lower. And so many of our members say, you know, I grew up going to my grandma and grandpa's farm, helping them in their garden. And I want that same experience for my kids. Or people want to start a garden and they don't have any experience and they can come out here and we can give them some pointers. So yeah, it's been great. It's great to see it in action. I think Theoretically, like in your mind, if you're out there listening and you're a vegetable grower, you think, oh, my God, I'm going to have all these people coming to my farm that don't know what the heck they're doing and they're going to start ripping up my crops. And uh, that is not the case. We have a very controlled environment for our membership when they come to help us. We are always supervising them and we only allow them to do certain tasks that we feel are, you know, the lowest kind of skill set required. So they're not picking tomatoes for the most part. They're not picking peppers. 
things where you kind of have to decide on ripeness and where the plants are more fragile. You know, they're helping us make kale bunches. They're helping us pull carrots out of the ground, digging sweet potatoes, and definitely helping us with high labor crops like peas and beans. It used to be cherry tomatoes, but we stopped growing cherry tomatoes. So there's that. And then we also have, you know, a wash area, packing room where they help wash the lettuces, all with supervision, all with food safety talk first. You know, they bag up beans for the shares. They clean garlic, clean onions. There's a lot of different jobs that people can sit down and clean onions or garlic if they're tired or if they have a bad back or something like that. So it works really well as long as you kind of have the parameters pretty strict to begin with and you don't have them do things that is, you know, beyond what somebody coming from the city that has never gardened before could be asked to do. We mulch, you know, we like to put hay or straw mulch sometimes on some of our crops and That's a low-skilled job. I mean, you know, some people are faster than others, but, you know, people pretty much understand how to put hay or straw around the crop. Sometimes they put it on too thinly, and you have to tell them to put it on thicker. So it's just a matter of being out there with them. Usually I'm in the packing room overseeing the washing and packing, and Tom's out in the field overseeing the harvesting. And then we have, you know, other employees that are around to kind of keep an eye as well. So not a lot of knife work, mostly hand labor and mostly pretty straightforward activities. Yeah, sometimes we do a lot of head lettuce. So that's something we will have people help us with. Although we've started picking our head lettuce the day before. So I guess we aren't doing as much of that now. Sometimes there's knife work, but, you know, one of the points in the safety talk is always, if you use sharp knives at home, you can use them here. Because, you know, we often have kids come with their parents. So not only food safety stuff, but also personal safety because we keep our knives sharp. You know, that's part of the talk. So we usually try and make sure we have, you know, if we're going to have a knife job, we'll have another job that's, that's just like pulling turnips out of the ground that kids can help with. But yeah, we don't have them do a lot of knife tasks really. And what kind of a retention rate do you guys have with your CSA? We average about 75%. Which, you know, it'd be nice if it was higher, but I hear that's decent for a CSA farm. We do a lot to make sure that our members are happy. You know, we survey, do a survey every year. So now, actually, one of the other things we did during our sabbatical year is we started using Small Farm Central. And that's been a great help for us because they can do things like rate the box or whatever. You know, there's a survey feedback function every time they get a share. Uh, if they want to rate it, they can. So we try and be really transparent about what we're doing at the farm. You know, all the typical things that people do for CSA, make sure they know how to cook it and eat it and store it and um, find out what's working for them, what's not. But at this point, we have a solid core of people that have been with us for, you know, 10 plus years. Of course, people move away or things change in their lives where they can't continue, but sometimes people come back as well. So I think we're right now at 95 members, but we've just got five more openings and the season starts in about a month. So I think we'll fill up and we tend to get referrals from our current membership. And that's how we get new people is through word of mouth from our existing membership. It's interesting to me that you've moved to an online sign-up because if I remember right, a number of years ago when you and I talked together about how to run a CSA, you and I taught a class somewhere, I can't remember where, but you guys were doing a much more elaborate in-person sign-up system at that point. Yeah, yeah. So Chris Blanchard, we did the CSA mini school at the Great Plains Growers Conference in St. Joe, Missouri. Thank you. And Elizabeth Henderson was the other speaker. And we were, we did that for about five years. Tom and I would bring in different CSA farmers to our little farming conference in St. Joe. And um, yeah, it was great to have you participate in that. And then I think we were at Practical Farmers of Iowa one year. That seems right to me, yeah. Yeah. For years, we had this in-person sign-up meeting, which is totally based on the piecework model. I I don't know what they do these days with the high-tech 
options that are out there now, but you know, everybody comes usually the first day of spring. It's kind of a way to celebrate the start of the season and they fill out their contracts and, you know, meet the partner vendors because we also have kind of a whole diet CSA option with our partner vendors that provide meat and cheese and other products. So anyway, it was kind of a big event for us. And for many years, we would bring it up to the core group and say, well, do we want to try and go online? Is that something we want to do? And every year they were like, no, we love having the in-person kind of party to start the season. But last year they were like, well, you know, it's a lot of work. You got all this paperwork that you're making photocopies. It just seems like it was getting a little out of date. So we decided to go with Small Farm Central and really we've been very happy. The members are all coming out to the farm. So we still get to see them. They get to interact with each other when they pick up their share. And, you know, we have a distribution team at each pickup site. So they kind of organize themselves and, you know, there's still a lot of community going on without that in-person sign-up. And it's allowed for us to accept, you know, online payments, credit cards through PayPal. It has allowed us to have a more efficient, what we call our bulk list. So we will, because we only grow fresh produce for the CSA and we don't take stuff to farmer's markets or other outlets, we would have extra stuff. There was stuff beyond what we needed for the shares that week. And so we have, have had for many years this email system where we would email out what was extra that week and people would email us back saying what they wanted, which was cumbersome. And we would also often miss orders or there would be confusion or just kind of hard to manage. So Small Farm Central has a, a way to have kind of an online store where people can do that. And it's a much better system as far as keeping track and people can make payments there instead of, you know, leaving cash at the distribution site that then we have to kind of figure out, well, who left that, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's definitely improved. And you don't feel like it's taken away from the sense of community. If the online signup was the only chance people had to kind of interact with each other or interact with the farmers, maybe that would be the case. But because we have this work requirement and we have like a very interactive distribution system model, Plus, we have a picnic at the farm in the fall. There's a lot of opportunities for people to have that community feel without the in-person sign-up. The other thing, you know, with the community is just all the involvement that our membership has. You know, we have the core group that coordinates a lot of stuff and then all these distribution captains. So there are, you know, kind of people uh, working on the CSA kind of the whole season through. So, yeah, it's a great model. We were really lucky to experience it at PeaceWork. I think it's a really kind of difficult thing to explain to somebody and have them go do, but we were lucky enough to, like I said, experience it. So it it wasn't a very hard sell for us. And then are you marketing through other outlets as well, or is everything that you do going through the CSA? All of our fresh produce is either going to the CSA or we are growing crops specifically for the kitchen. So cabbage, napa cabbage, carrots and onions and cucumbers, you know, we're growing more of those crops so that we have them for the ferment. But otherwise, we go to a winter farmer's market and sometimes we will bring leftover potatoes, beets, carrots, things that are in storage after the CSA season is over. But for the most part, you know, it all goes to the CSA members or to the kitchen. The ferments, we're um, looking for farmer's market and retail sales for those, as well as the CSA. Okay. And do you have the ferments in stores now when you talk about retail sales or? Yes. So last year we were able to get into about four different stores in the Kansas City area, which is kind of nice. They're kind of north, south, east, and west of town. So this year, this spring, we applied for a USDA evaluated producer grant. And it was good. Just even the application kind of helped us look at our... Um, kind of the volumes we had and what we'd be projecting and really what our business plan was going to be with the ferments. So we want to get into more stores. We've been doing a lot of uh, talking with different stores and there's like food hubs around right now. We're looking at like bulk sales, possibly to 
restaurants. We can sell our ferments in gallon tubs, and they're good for salad bars or for delis, things like that. We're really looking to expand our retail and wholesale sales this year. And is the fermentation business a a scalable business for you guys? Is that something that you're going to be able to continue to expand to meet that increased demand? We'll be able to scale up some. We were just looking and, you know, you can get a lot off of uh, an acre or even a half acre if you're doing the ferments. And we have about five acres here on the farm that we can grow on. And so uh, we're going to the point now where we're going to have close to half to, or even more in cover crops at any one point in time. So we have some room there to grow as far as having more vegetables for the ferments. But yeah, I mean, we're with the value added producer grant, realize we only need, you know, maybe 2,000 like regular customers would be good enough for our kind of cottage industry. That's one way we're kind of looking at this. If you look at a winery or a dairy, you have an agricultural product that's grown on a piece of land and then it's processed and in both those cases actually fermented on the property. And so now we're doing that with vegetables. So, we, you know, and there's nobody else that we really know that's doing that. So we're kind of in uncharted territory around here, but it is all in the same vein as uh, these other agricultural businesses. So, uh, yeah, we're going to just kind of see how it goes too. So tell me a little bit more about how that fermentation process works. I once made a five gallon batch of sauerkraut and it was really good, but man, was it a lot of work to get it all salted and pounded and it felt like a lot of monkey business. Yeah. One thing with the fermentation, we'd always in our vision plan kind of had possibly having value added products and I've done a lot of home preserving and realized that I wasn't going to like boil water for people and sterilize jars for tomato sauce and jams and stuff. And the ferments, the process takes place at room temperature. So it, it's low in energy. And the other thing is when we decided to go into us, we really wanted to kind of close the loop. You know, we've been spending a lot of our efforts on building the soil and just tie this whole biological process kind of together. You know, we've been working on the microbiome of the soil. With the fermenting, we're stressing what's going on in the ferments. And then there's the microbiome of our bodies. And it's all the same thing. So since we've been doing it, even it's like we eat the ferments all the time. We can almost, you know, kind of feel the, the positive benefits of that. As far as the difficulty of doing it, it's a little tricky, but, uh, you know, we have, we bought a new cooler. So we have a good place to store crops like cabbage. You can, you can hold those until you need to, to work on them. It's neat having a kitchen with no stove, you know, and that was kind of different for the, for the health department. They have a kitchen with no stove. There is some equipment you can buy to help chop the vegetables. We use a lot of um, five-gallon, seven-gallon food-grade pails. So we've developed a pretty good system, I think, to, to kind of have a quality control over our product. Another part of it is the whole idea that as, as we get older, as farmers, maybe half the day could be in the kitchen instead of out in the field. So it's a way to kind of balance our lives at the same time. So tell me about the actual physical process. What do you go through in making a batch of sauerkraut? So like sauerkraut, we grow the cabbage. You know, when we promote our product, we say, you know, that's the first step of our recipe is raising the vegetables. It's very important to us. You are what you eat, so you are what your plants eat. So we try to stress to people we've been building the soil on our farm for 16 years and the flavor and the nutrition that you taste in our product really comes from our growing practices. So we'll harvest, say, the cabbage, we'll store it in our cooler, and then when we're ready to make the kraut, we'll, we'll take it out. You kind of trim the end and take off the outer leaves. You core it and quarter it, and then we have a, like a drum shredder. It's a hand crank, and you just put it in that and crank away, and you've got this shredded cabbage, and then you add salt and put it into a, a bucket and make sure it's submerged in the liquid. That's one of the important things about fermenting is making sure that it's anaerobic, that all the solids, all the vegetables are below the level of the juice that gets extracted and then monitor it in case of sauerkraut. It's about, it's a good month at about room temperature and you measure the pH. That is the kill step. So for the hazard, uh, the HACCP plan, the main kind of parameter that you want to look 
for for food safety is the pH of the sauerkraut. So it can start out at somewhere around five or so, and then it'll usually, by the time it's done, it's down close to 3.2, 3.4, somewhere in there, which is 10 times more acidic than it needs to be. And then once it's, um, the fermentation is complete and it's relatively stable, we put it in our cooler. And then when it's time to sell it, we'll take it out. We'll fill labeled jars or the one gallon pails, and then we'll put it in a, Another cooler we have that's uh, cold and dry, so the, the boxes and everything stay, don't get all damp, and it's ready to sell. What other products are you guys fermenting for sale? So we also make kimchi, which is a little more complicated. It's, it has more ingredients, and so there's more chopping. We have two types of kimchi. We have what we call a regular kimchi, which is made with mainly with Napa cabbage, and then a green kimchi, which we make with bok choy and tak soy. So those, we have to buy ginger and organic ginger and organic paprika. But other than that, and the, and the salt that we buy, which is Redmond sea salt out of Utah, it's a pink salt. Those are the only things that are not raised on the farm that go into our jars. So our jars have over 95% product just from the farm. Then we make a uh, jalapeno dish, jalapeno and escabeche. It's a traditional Mexican recipe. And then uh, cucumber pickles. Those are what we're working on now. There's more products that we could possibly make in the future. Daikon, radishes, you can make pickles out of that and some other things. But, um, you know, like I say, you made kraut once. It's We feel good. We have a year under our belt because you can make a bucket of something that's really delicious or like a bucket of mush. You know, it, it's easy but hard at the same time to ferment. So growing all the ingredients, it's really helped us in our quality step. In doing something that's, well, I'm just going to go with the word weird from a food processing standpoint. I mean, you know, usually when we talk about a kill step, it's like pour in the vinegar or heat the thing up. And I can imagine that your county health department must have been a little bit confused by, I want to ferment and sell things. Yeah. You know, if anybody's been in food service, you know that Leaving something at 70 degrees for more than four hours is a no-no, and we're leaving things at that for a month. You know, and I've taken a lot of food safety classes, and they never even mention fermentation. So, you know, it's kind of frustrating having to get these certificates, and they don't even talk about what it is we're doing. But it's an ancient, it's one of the oldest forms of food preservation that there is. So it's weird to us in modern society, but... It's really fundamental to civilization's existence to be able to store food naturally. You know, we try to, you know, it's a live culture, so we have to refrigerate it after we make it. So it's a probiotic. You know, it's really a missing link in many people's diet. You know, the thing about, you know, the soil, the soil and plants, it's a co-evolved symbiotic relationship, right? Plants and soil microorganisms, they grew up together. They have a long-term relationship. We're the same way with the bacteria in our digestive system, you know. They're, they're not just any microorganisms. They're, they're what we co-evolved with and have a symbiotic relationship with. And so we're tying all that together. So from a health standpoint, that's an important part of our product. Another is the flavor and nutrition. Our sauerkraut is just our cabbage and salt. So all the flavor that is in that is really from our soil building. And I think most people know if something has flavor naturally, it tends to really have more nutrition, all those flavonoids and not MSG that's giving you the flavor. It's the actual vegetable. And it's a biological diversity. Any biological life survives best when there's a lot of diversity. So it helps to incorporate more diversity in your lives. And you know, the other thing that we're trying to stress to people is, um, but in doing all this, we also are um, taking carbon dioxide out of the air. On, on the lid of our jars, we say uh, carbon was sequestered making this product. And we feel that's real important for people to know. I mean, that, you know, when you talk about a value-added product, that's one of the values. We uh, can measurably say that we are reversing climate change by growing our vegetables and making the products that we make. And we think that has a lot of value and we want people to understand what that value is. Yeah, and Tom did this whole calculation, which you mentioned earlier, 
with just the organic matter that we've increased in the soil, you know, and then you get a calculation based on our energy use on the farm. We purchase uh, wind energy credits from our local rural electric co-op. And so, you know, if you calculate our energy use on the farm and um, look at the organic matter improvements, we're on the positive side of, of sequestering carbon. That's kind of where all that statement that we're, you know, sequestering carbon comes from. Got it. All right. Now we're going to stop here, take a quick break, get a word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Rebecca and Tom from Fair Share Farm in Kearney, Missouri. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. Through 23 years of producing the best potting soils you can buy, Vermont Compost Company founder and owner Carl Hammer has stayed intimately involved in the company, working with a small staff of committed individuals to provide compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients. The people at Vermont Compost Company have a practical understanding of the challenges that organic growers face, and they combine that with a comprehensive understanding of soil and plant science and an intuitive comprehension that often has Carl and his crew sticking their noses into a handful of compost and inhaling deeply as though they were sampling a fine brandy. Vermont Compost is the real thing. It's built on consistency instead of glitz. Like that donkey on their logo, Vermont Compost Potting Soils aren't glitzy, they aren't glamorous, they're steadfast, they're consistent, and they're stubbornly making certain that your transplants can get everything they need from a few cubic centimeters of soil. Oh, and the donkeys, by the way, they're the real thing. You get a little bit of donkey manure in every batch of Vermont Compost Potting Soil. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com Support for the podcast is also brought to you by Local Food Marketplace. Are you trying to scale up without the right systems? Instead of juggling email and text orders, spreadsheets for harvest packing and delivery, and separate invoicing systems, Local Food Marketplace's software platform will help you automate these tasks and decrease errors with its fully integrated system for online orders, inventory management, order packing, invoicing, and payment processing. Easily configure the system for managing multiple sales channels, customer types, price levels, and delivery routes. The platform also offers lot number traceability and an option to collaboratively sell products with other producers. Contact them via their website, localfoodmarketplace.com, to schedule a free consultation on how Local Food Marketplace can help you efficiently manage customer orders from your pack house to your customer's doorstep. All right, and we're back with Rebecca Graff and Tom Ruggieri from Kearney, Missouri. You know, before we went on our break, we were talking about the carbon sequestration a little bit as, as kind of a function of your vegetable production and how important that is to you guys as farmers. I know that there are some other things that you've done that fit into that energy conservation, carbon sequestration model. One of them being your passive solar greenhouse. Right. Yeah. When we moved back here, one of the first things we did was we built our greenhouse it was built on a part of the farm that used to have an old chicken house that was somewhat passive solar. It was built into the side of a south-facing hill and not far from the house and the barns. But that building was long gone. There were just kind of some big chunks of concrete left from it. And uh, we did some dirt work and pretty much replicated the space that that took up and we have now I guess it's a 12 by 60 we we added on a little bit a couple of years ago so it's very long and narrow and that's to take advantage of the south sun in the winter months when we're starting our seeds it's well insulated on the north side partially below ground on that side and then we have black 55 gallon barrels that are filled with water inside of the greenhouse on the north wall so the sun can shine on those, heat up the water that are that's inside of the barrels, and then that moderates the temperature overnight as the temperature outside cools down. That heat that's been stored in the water is released passively into our greenhouse. And so are you providing supplemental heat in that greenhouse, or is it completely done with the passive solar design? We have heat mats for germinating flats or keeping, you know, our peppers and tomatoes warm if we need to. But that's really the extent of our supplemental heat in that greenhouse. 
it stays above freezing without any supplemental heat. And if we're starting crops in February and, and March in there, if we have the heat mats going, then, you know, that's really all you need is to keep the soil warm. If the air temperature is cooler, you know, that doesn't really affect the plant. We do have tables you know with the heat mats on them and then if we need to we will put a piece of row cover over the table um, just to hold even more of that heat from the heat mats in overnight but uh, yeah it works really well and and we've been really happy with the design we kind of stole the design from this missouri university of missouri extension location farther south from us they were actually had a similar building not built into the side of the hill, just freestanding, but they were growing crops inside, kind of like a combination of a high tunnel, but insulated more. So we took that design and adapted it to build our greenhouse. We do have a ventilation fan. It will get, you know, warm in the summer. So we have this kind of typical fan and louvers, thermostat controlled to keep, you know, things from getting too hot in there. Is that the only space that you guys are using for transplant production on the farm? Or do you have additional greenhouses, high tunnels, things like that that you're using? Yeah, we grow all of our transplants in the passive solar greenhouse, but we do have a high tunnel on the farm as well. We have a 30 by 96 high tunnel that we built 2012, something like that. And um, that is just for season extension for the CSA vegetables. So we planted in September for November and December harvest, and we planted again, you know, in February for April into May harvest. So that gives us uh, another two weeks on either side of the growing season for us here in northern Missouri. And we're growing cool weather crops in that. We're not growing tomatoes. We're growing spinach and chard and lettuces and salad turnips and things like that that can handle cool weather. Um, it's unheated high tunnel. You guys also have an electric tractor, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's always uh, something people want to see when they come out. Ron Colsa is at Flying Deep Farm down there in New York City. He came up with the design for it, and he part of a SARE project. The details for it are online. And so we found a Alice Chalmers G back in 07 and converted it to electric. And so that's kind of neat to be able to have. It's a real workhorse. We have uh, cultivators, hillers, cedars that we use on it, and we can get a good acre or more out of it, drag and steal through the field with it on a charge. We have a solar powered irrigation system. We have a pond and there's like a a well pump in it and we have about a kilowatt worth of panels and so that's on demand we can turn that on and that supplies all of our irrigation needs totally off grid yeah you know, like rebecca said our we pay two and a half cents extra to our electric co-op to be on their green power program and we get renewable energy credits for that so the tractor is being charged through the grid and so it's kind of being charged on wind power so all those things Together, they really help us. We've done a little kind of annual CO2 emissions from the farm, and uh, so our electrical, we don't have any emissions associated with anything we plug in. We have about, we figure about 20,000 pounds of carbon dioxide just from all our vehicles, and then we have uh, propane for hot water, and then we sequester a good 50,000 pounds of carbon dioxide through our cover cropping and farming practices. So over the last eight to 10 years, every year we've had a negative carbon footprint. So, you know, it's been neat to kind of started looking at this a couple of years ago, kind of drawing on my environmental engineering background. You know, we have all this data and numbers and to really look at it. And it's nice to be able to have some type of quantification of that. So tell me a little bit more about the cover crop rotation that you're using, since that seems to be a very important part of your carbon sequestration plan? It took us uh, several years to kind of figure out the best crops to grow here, the best way to seed them. Buckwheat kind of took root the best when we first started, but it really doesn't add a lot of organic matter. But it was, you know, started giving us good kind of practice. What we tend to do is we'll grow peas and oats in the spring. We use uh, sorghum sedan grass and either cow peas or sun hemp in the summer. And then 
sometimes we'll do some peas and oats again in the fall if we want something winter killed or, or we'll use rye and vetch. So, you know, we don't really double crop anything. And so every year we try to have every bed that we use either get a cover crop or get mulched or get compost or have chickens on it or have a organic fertilizer put on it. So in general, we cover crop, oh, two or so acres, maybe two and a half a year. So that's kind of been our plan is to put cover crops in whenever we can. The summer, the spring crops come out, you know, the broccoli or whatever is done and in June and we plant sedan grass and cow peas and then we turn that in. We usually turn it in kind of late in the year, September or so, and um, let it decompose some, but then, you know, there'd still be residue underground in the spring and then, and then that would kind of help add some, some nutrients and life to the soil once the soil warmed back up. And how are you getting those cover crops seeded on a farm that's your scale? Because it seems like you guys are a little bit on the small side for a drill. Yeah, you know, we were looking for a drill. We were part of a, a SARE um, roller crimper project. So part of that was going to be to get a drill, and we couldn't find one around here. We actually then ended up buying like a vegetable seeder for a row and kind of going back and forth with that twice, and that didn't work very well. And it turns out for us what seems to work the best is just to broadcast seed with like an earthway and then harrow it in. That can even help. It's almost like one extra little bit of stale seabed, you know, harrowing before, right when the crop goes in. So that's what we've been doing. And yeah, we're, you know, we're a smaller scale farm and it really doesn't hurt to walk the fields anyway while you're doing that. So that works well for us. And then tell me a little bit more about the growing setup that you have at your scale of operation. How are you going about getting the soil tilled and getting the crops into the field? We have a spader, which we've had since our first year or so. So that's our primary tillage piece of equipment. But, you know, Tom handles most of the bed prep, and he's really gotten away from doing a lot of spading. He tends to use the spader for incorporating cover crops. And then once that's accomplished, we're using our cultivators to kind of break up the top of the soil and then we have two discs on a toolbar that we call it a gutterer. We can also call it a raised bed, you know, bed shaper. We put that on the G, the Alice Chalmers G, and drive that down the bed to create, you know, a little bit of a raised bed. And then we're either, we still do some hand planting for small plantings, but we do have a transplanter, just, you know, a water wheel transplanter that we pull behind our grandpa tractor, uh, the International 504. So, you know, any of our big crops like potatoes, onions, cabbage, we try and use it as much as possible. Just saves a lot of time and a lot of back aches. So we use a transplanter for a lot of things. Um, We also have a Planet Junior three-row seeder that is designed on a toolbar for the G. So we direct seed our carrots and beets and other large plantings of uh, direct seeded crops with that planter. We still use some earthways here and there. Like we just planted our peas and we ended up using earthways for that. For one thing, we were training apprentices, so it's a good experience for them. And it's just easier than kind of reformatting our three-row seeder to become a two-row close together seeder for what we want for the peas that need to be trellised. So we tend to grow, plant two rows kind of close together for that. I think that pretty much covers it. You know, we've experimented with other seeders. We would love to not have to thin carrots. And so uh, two years ago, we bought a Jang, just so, you know, a push one row, walk down the bed, push it, jang, and we have not gotten it to cooperate. I don't know if it's our soils or what, but we have had horrible germination with it. We probably need to talk to the jang rep, but we've kind of gone back to using earthways and uh, sticking with our Planet Junior Cedar because every time we use it, the carrots come up great. They don't come out perfectly spaced, but they come up. So that's Pretty much, you know, our, our, our planting methods, 
And then depending on the crop, how much, you know, attention it needs after that kind of depends. But last year, so part of our sabbatical, if you can call it that, was also to move towards this idea of planting half of the ground in cash crops and planting half of the ground in cover crops. And so we started doing that last year, and Tom spent a lot of time on the cover crop areas doing cultivation before we seeded them to really get some of the weeds under control. So we're hoping that that's going to really be a great benefit to the farm down the road to be able to have that time to really do the stale seed bed method where we get rid of a lot of weed seeds in our soil. Because the first few years, you know, we realize now we were just planting way more than we could manage. And um, the 15th year we're coming on now, we're finally figuring some of that out. Like we need time to get those weed seeds out of our soil before we plant. So kind of going to more of what I would call a, a Nordell style rotation. Yeah, and you know, there was a year at Great Plains where I think the Nordells were there, and then uh, Henry Brockman from, uh, I forget the name of his farm, he was part of our CSA mini school, and there might even been some other farmer from New Jersey, and they were all doing the plant half of it in cash crops, plant the other half in cover crops, and it just kind of blew us away. It took us a few years to really figure it out that we could do that here. But yeah, we just, you know, it's hard for us to come up with the amount of compost that we would need to not do that. We've always relied on cover crops for a lot of our fertility. We introduced, you know, laying hens to our farming operation a few years back, and that has helped. But we're still relying on the cover crops to really provide the majority of our nutrient needs. So yeah, we're really excited about shifting to that. Yeah, Nordell model as far as cat and it's also good for you know i've been working a lot on kind of creating insectaries for beneficial insects and i mean there's so many benefits to having flowering crops near your cash crops to bring in those beneficials that really reduce the pest pressure and have you guys seen a difference since you've started planting those insectary plants yeah last year we spent some time putting in an insectary within our blocks. We started using one of these silage tarps. So it's 100 by 50 feet. And within that, we can get eight beds and then like kind of a half bed. So that half bed becomes an insectary. And um, we saw a lot less caterpillar damage in our tomatoes. Sometimes we get a lot of those fruit worms in the tomatoes. And there were hardly any you know, I see those little wasps flying around with caterpillars in their clutches, and it makes me happy. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to see it all, you know, because so many of those insects are so tiny, you, you know, you can't even see what's going on. But we saw less pest pressure last year, and we, we're assuming that that was the result of having the insectary in there. And we'll we'll see if it's similar this year. You know, one year isn't much to base things on, so I guess I'm still hedging a little bit, but it seems to be working. With that, we're going to turn to our lightning round, but first we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor. This lightning round is brought to you by Haas Tools, the complete solution for all your market farming tools and supplies. Keep your rows weed-free with their time-tested American-made wheel hose and the best wheel hoe attachments. Their precision seeders have a proven seed plate design for planting a wide variety of seeds. And you can grow the best transplants with their heavy-duty PropTech seed trays. And you keep your crops healthy with their drip irrigation and fertilizer injection systems. Haas also provides a comprehensive selection of conventional and OMRI certified pest control products at the most affordable prices. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HaasTools.com. Rebecca, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Well, I have to say our chickens. They do a lot of work for us. They eat bugs. They break down old crop residue. They're a huge amusement for ourselves and for our CSA members that come out to the farm. They do so much work and they don't really look like they're working at all. So, you know, they have a special place in my heart. You know, 
they're kind of fun and amusing as something that you can't apply to very many tools. I mean, it's not like you you don't look at the hose hanging on the wall. And go, oh, yeah, it's a fun thing. Tom, do you have a favorite tool on the farm? Well, I think it's starting to be our um, sweep cultivator. You know, we were just talking about the stale seed bed, and it's something that can uh, really get in there and clean up the bed well for us out of all the cultivators that we've tried. So I'm starting to like that. When you talk about a sweep cultivator, is this something that you're running behind the tractor as a as a stale bedding tool, or is this something you're running underneath the G as a between-the-row weeding tool? It's behind the tractor, and then, you know, it's nice because it's more of an undercutting tool. Some of the other cultivators we've had, you know, it hits a weed and just kind of goes around it, whereas this, you know, we've even had, like, dock be pulled up by it, and so it's a pretty hefty tool. You know, we're trying to do more shallow tillage. That was the other thing. You know, talking to Nordells, you know, the shallower we can cultivate, the better, too. And so using kind of when you talk about a sweep cultivator, then these are these are wider sweeps that are maybe mounted on a C shank that hooks up to a toolbar. Yeah. You know, the big V shape flying V type sweep. Rebecca, what's Tom's farming superpower? OK, <laughs> let's see here. You know. He loves growing cover crops. I joke that he loves growing cover crops more than he loves growing cash crops. But he puts a lot of energy and time and attention into making sure he gets a good seed, you know, germination and he gets out there when it needs to be mowed down. And, you know, it's great to have that energy going to that step because it's such an important step on our farm super cover cropper, I think, be his title. And Tom, same question for you. What's Rebecca's farming superpower? I think she's a, a really good uh, listener. So, you know, she can, whether it's uh, the chickens or our animals or the plants or anything, I think she listens to them well and to have an understanding of what's going good and what isn't. And she'll even talk to them. So... I think it's her communication skills with kind of all the living things on the farm. Rebecca, what do you talk to the plants about? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I don't know. I I would love it if they would talk back to me, but it's usually a pretty one-way conversation. But, um, you know, they talk by the color of their leaves and, you know, how well they're growing. So they communicate plenty of information with that, actually. Speaking, of course. I think it just comes from growing up out here and not having any neighbors to play with and just kind of having my own little like world that I was in. So, you know, I'm kind of going back to my childhood of just talking to the trees or whatever, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I talk to the chickens too. And I just kind of warn people when they start working with us, you know, that I'm going to be talking to inanimate objects and don't worry, I'm not insane. Food safety training, inanimate object talking training. You just kind of make sure that people are ready for their farming experience. Rebecca, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Oh, I would say Try not to grow more than you can handle. I guess it's hard to tell myself that when I started because I thought we were growing what we could handle at the time. But, you know, I think we just tried to do too much at the start. And we were only kind of fixing those things now to where, you know, we're at a scale that we can manage So, yeah, grow slower or be more deliberate with your crop choices. Grow what grows well. (laughs) I guess that's three things, but or at least two. But you could make it all into one sentence, so we'll let it fly. Tom, if you could go back in time until you're beginning farmer self one thing, what would you say? Yeah, I think it would be to uh, get some laying hens to start the farm. We've really enjoyed having the hens, the farm fresh egg is you know really the perfect food i think it's really healthy to have around and working them into a vegetable rotation has just been really helpful for us and like with the csa you know we tend to be just vegetable farmers and like to say that you know you get some chickens or something it adds some 
EIEIO to the farm, which is nice when you have members come out with their kids. And it's just one more thing to have out here to, to show people what raising food's about. Tom and Rebecca, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's such a great resource for farmers, and we're still so honored to be a part of it. Yeah, thanks, Chris. It's been great to talk to you, and thanks again for doing this. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 170 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Fair Share. That's F-A-I-R-S-H-A-R-E, Fair Share. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk blind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit osborneseed.com for high-quality seeds, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your email inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. If you like the show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. You can also talk to us in the show notes. You can tell your friends about us on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource that you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I am working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help right there. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there, and keep the tractor running.